Thank you so much for coming here today. We are joined by a longtime veteran of the independent wrestling scene, a member of Ring of Honor during the company's early years, who also appeared in Full Impact Pro, TNA Wrestling, has appeared on WWE television, and perhaps most notably, Billy Corgan's National Wrestling Alliance. Sal, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, just just reading off all that list was uh, exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's crazy because I, I'm 31, and I've been a fan of wrestling since as far back as I can remember. I You first came on my radar with Ring of Honor. Okay. And it's crazy to me that that, you know, I wasn't into it in 2002, 2003, 2004, but I got into it probably 2005, 2006. And it's crazy to me that it's been that long. And when I was yeah. doing research on you, you have had such a, like, tenured career. Yeah, and it's crazy. It's one of those things where it seems like it started 20 minutes ago, and it also seems like it started 200 years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just been uh, – I'm a very fortunate dude, man, and I, I'm the same as you. I grew up a wrestling fan. Like, that's what uh, – that's, that's all I've ever wanted, you know? Like, I was that was it. I remember very vividly uh, in third grade, I was uh, – we were going around the room. The teacher was asking, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And little Timmy wanted to be a dentist. And little Michelle wanted to be a doctor. And uh, little 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 Bobby wanted to be a dinosaur. I just wanted to be a pro wrestler. And I remember my teacher saying, I think little Bobby's got a better shot at being a dinosaur. <laughs> so uh, take that, Miss Bradshaw. <laughs> Definitely proved her wrong. Now, so when did you, do you remember when you first started watching? Like, did you have a clear memory of your first match or first show or anything? No, I kind of, like, the, the the earliest memory I have is uh, just a random superstars. And I couldn't even tell you. I mean, I know it was Bam Bam Bigelow uh, is, like, kind of my earliest, like, if I yeah, dig deep in the memory banks. But I also know. I liked it before then. Uh, just, you know, I, I I just can't remember a time I wasn't enamored by pro wrestling. I always say uh, Hulk Hogan was the dude that caught my interest first, you know, just because he was a cartoon. You, you, uh, I was a big cartoon, you know. I mean, the 80s were just such a different time. If you were, if you had a cartoon series, you were beyond superstar status. You were everything. And to find out that this dude was real, like, oh, my God. So, you know, I would tune in to see Hogan, but I stayed because Savage. Uh, Randy Savage was just that guy. But, like, you never knew what you were going to get, but you always knew it was going to be something awesome. Uh, he's the guy that, you know, in the same promo can laugh and cry and yell and scream and speak real softly and make you listen, you know, and just, uh, he always had different gear, which is always, which is big to me. You know, he had the glasses, he had the robes. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, just, I can't remember a time in my life where pro wrestling wasn't in it, you know? No, absolutely. And, you know, you touched on a few great things there for one macho man, Randy Savage, Hulk Hogan's great. I personally think like a lot of modern fans can't appreciate his impact, especially how big yeah, he was. And yes. it, you know, even I, I mean, I wasn't born yet in the eighties, but I was in the nineties. Right. So I saw the second run of his massive career because that's what people yes. don't forget. There's been a few guys who have had one massive run. He's had two massive runs. two. Yeah. No, the, the whole NWO thing is just, I, you know, like I lived it, you know, like, uh, uh, I remember very vividly. I so like I didn't watch Bash at the Beach '96 live because I was actually helping out at an indie show. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, and for whatever reason they were running a Sunday night, and uh, so you know, like thank God this is the era before cell phones and all that stuff and spoilers. You know, so like it's not like anybody in the building was like, oh my God, it was Hogan. It was Ho you know, I had no clue. Uh, I had a buddy that had the illegal black box and he knew I was going to this show to help out. He recorded bash at the beach for me. And so when I got home that night, he gave me the VHS 
tape that he recorded. And he was like, you know, and I, he, he, he wouldn't tell me, thank God, he didn't tell me who the third member was. But he gives me this VHS and I go home and I'm just like, oh! And I mean, that whole Hollywood Hogan run was so different than the 80s run. But yet it was so big like his 80s run. It's unreal uh, what all, I mean, Hogan's career just is insane. No, absolutely. It's spectacular. And then with Savage, the thing that was great about him is even like as a kid, there was an air of unpredictability where yes. obviously when I wasn't even smart yet, I just knew like he could fly off the handle at any time and you didn't know what to expect. Even if you kind of knew what to expect with everything else, with him, there was just, there was a magic there. Absolutely. And he was the guy that like, he was the first guy I re- when the mega powers exploded, like I said, uh, Hogan drew me in, but Savage was the guy that kept me. And when the Mega Powers exploded, I was genuinely torn. Because, like, I know what Savage was doing was quote-unquote bad, but, like, that was still my dude. So, like, uh, he was the first heel that I was like, you know what? It's okay. <laughs> he, he, I'm still going to cheer for him, you know? And I'm... I'm what, 89, I'm seven years old, you know, battling, you know, good versus evil. And uh, it just, I couldn't not, you know, I would find myself like at five, I wanted Hogan to win. I was happy Hogan won. But then, like, in subsequent weeks, I was just like, I think I want Randy Savage to be champ again. <laughs> that's great. And I get it though, because that's how I was um, with The Undertaker. He was always my favorite, like from a young age, you know. And it's funny yes, because yes. he was terrifying, but you know, when I was in that sweet spot of like five or six, he was like in his prime baby phase run at the time of like 96, 97. Yeah. And then the ministry happened and he's feuding with the Undertaker and every or with some folks Steve Austin. And everybody's Austin, gonna be yeah. Austin side. But I was sitting there cheering for the guy who wanted to embalm Austin with Paul <laughs> Bear. Yes. yes. But uh, no, that's crazy. And I had no idea you broke into the business that early. Like, I, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, um, and I'm skipping ahead just a little bit, but you're fine. Um, you know, I checked different resources because, again, I started following you in Ring of Honor, but before that, you know, Wikipedia lists you as coming in at 2000, Cage Match in 1998, but Cage Match also lists your earliest match in 2001, so that's a mess. But yeah, I know. When did you first, I guess, when did you first decide, you said you wanted to be a wrestler in third grade. When did yes. you first take steps towards that? When did you find out about independence? When did that all happen? Well, so I, uh, I, I'm a big believer, a big proponent. I tell all the younger kids that I work with nowadays that uh, do as I say, not as I did, because I did everything the wrong way. Uh, learn from my horrible decisions. Uh, like I said, I mean, wrestling was always just my thing, right? So, like, uh, I was, I, w- I, I grew up in California which was primarily a WWE territory. You know, that's, you know, that was the big stars on the TV. And uh, it wasn't until I found the after mags that I was like, oh, oh, there's a whole world besides WWE. You know, and that's what, it, 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 that's where I got introduced to the NWA and world class and, and the stuff in Memphis and just, you know, like just all this other, insane world out there that I can really only consume uh, through these magazines. But uh, I was always real big and I, it, it's funny to me, you know, going forward, but I was always real big on flipping to the back of the after mags and reading the results by state. Uh, not just to see what happened on WWF house shows, but to see what happened in, you know, on a random Tuesday in Philly or, or whatever. I, you know, like I was just so enamored with pro wrestling that anything I could get my hands on, I would get. And that's how I started finding out about Indies. So uh, I was aware, like uh, my favorite story about all that is when I was uh, in 93, 94, uh, my little brother and I, like we set up our own makeshift wrestling ring in our backyard, which wasn't, it was just mattresses. And then we dug four posts 
four wooden posts and put bungee cord, <laughs> and that was our ropes. Uh, you know, like you couldn't just stand on them or anything, but it was just like it was as close to a ring as you could get. And like we we knew to protect each other. Like we weren't we weren't doing back lower wrestling like it became. You know, mm. with light tubes and jumping off stuff. We were just emulating the guys we saw on TV, and we were always be those guys. Like I was never a character, uh, like my own made up character. I was always like. You know, I want to be Macho Man. I want to be Shawn Michaels. I want to be Razor Ramon or whomever. And uh, I remember very vividly, he and I used to uh, get in massive battles over who got to be Sabu. Keep in mind, I'd never seen Sabu wrestle. He had never seen Sabu wrestle. We just saw this crazy, scarred-up guy upside down in the after magazine. So we were like, oh, no, he's the best. Like, no clue anything about him other than what we read about. And that's kind of the gateway to the Indies for us. Uh, Fast forward a little bit to uh, 96, and I found out there was a promotion that was running a show at the Boys and Girls Club about three blocks from my house. And so, uh, you know, doors were usually at 6. I was there at 11 a.m. every day. Yeah, every every time there was a show, I was there at 11 a.m. You know, like, I will do anything to help. Like, and and fortunately, uh, they either were lazy and just wanted some punk kid to help, or they saw, you know, like, oh, this kid really wants it. We'll throw him a bone. But, like, you know, they let me me set up chairs. They let me help put up the ring. They let me sell the hot dogs. They let me sell the tickets. They let me whatever. You know, and I was game for whatever because it's pro wrestling, right? So I could do whatever I want. And part of the deal was once the ring got put up and everything got organized, if there was time, they'd let me get the ring, uh, which was heaven to me. Like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. Like, I get to be in a pro wrestling ring. How old did you uh, say you were at this point? Sorry. At this point, I uh, I was 13. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. So you were quite young at this point. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and. You know, like, fortunately, just because, like I said, it's it's been something that was, I kind of got things. Like, I didn't get, you know, it's not like I walked in the door and got it. But, like, I understood how to do a collar and elbow tie-up pretty much before anybody taught me just because I'd seen 800 million of them in my life. Uh, so some of the guys would get me in the ring to bump me around just because, they didn't want to bump each other. And they're like, hey, this idiot kid will fall down for us a million times and get up and do it again, uh, which 100%, yes, please. <laughs> bump me again. I'm game, right? So uh, they kind of, I, I kind of grew on people and they kind of, you know, taught me different little things, but it was never like like a, a, a training school where I was like, hey, this is the day I learned how to run the ropes. And this is the day how, you know, this is the day we worked on chain wrestling. And this is whatever, whatever. It was just kind of like, hey, do you know how to take a hip toss? Well, I know what a hip toss is. Okay, tuck your chin. Here we go. You know, <laughs> like, all right. Now I'm doing taking hip tosses so the guys can transition to their next spot. Uh and so that was my true. Like I said, my my training was done in every fathomable, incorrect way. Uh, it, add to the fact I was also thirteen years old, so that's <laughs> it's a little young. It's a little young. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> no, out of curiosity, was your like family there with you, or was it just you and maybe your little brother? Like, no, no. It was it was basically just me. So. Uh, I, I don't really have much of a family life. My dad left when I was real young. And then uh, my mom kind of just, she kind of lived in her own little world. So like, I, cause I, I've been out on my own since I was 14. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Like uh, she, yeah, like I said, it was just, it just was really not a good dynamic. So uh, at 14, the summer that that's, the summer of my my 14th year going on 15 because uh, I'm a September baby. Uh, she said, uh, you got to go. So I went, you know, like it wasn't even like a, a fight. 
you know, it was just one of those things where she was done. I was like, all right, man, cool, whatever. I'll figure it out. And so I uh, spent a lot of time on friends' couches, a uh, couple couple nights, you know, at the park or whatever. Uh, but, you know, like I was always there when that show was running. Like I, 11 a.m. didn't matter. I'd find a way to be there. That's kind uh, of the beauty of wrestling, though, right? Like in a way, pro wrestling – at times it's kind of like the land of misfit toys where, oh. you know, you have people from all different angles and all different corners who, yes, they might yeah. never meet, but there's something pulls them together. And Yes. No. And that's one of my favorite things. You just, some of my closest friends in wrestling in any other setting, I would never say a single word to these people, but we have that one common bond. And through that bond, like this friendship has grown where now they're, irreplaceable parts of my life uh and it, it's because pro wrestling like i'm a, I'm a big I, and, it, and it, especially now that i'm older too i'm so i i think it's just so cool like spending time in the locker room and just finding out other people's stories like how'd you get here you know what's your background it's just it's it's crazy to me the different dynamics uh the, the different lives everybody's led that has all led them to one one spot you know i, I just think it's it's super cool that it's you know a, a lot of times i'll say well that's only pro wrestling only pro wrestling could this happen uh and you know that's you know they, they, that's just my story you know like everybody's story is different but uh i'm genuinely i'll forever be grateful to pro wrestling because that's what got me that's what got me through, you know, like I'm, I'm usually a, a pretty positive guy anyways, but like, uh, even as a kid, like I've never, I've never drank alcohol in my life. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never done a drug, uh, because pro wrestling, you know, mm -hmm. I was just like, I don't, you know, obviously I was way wrong, but I was like, pro wrestlers don't do that. They're athletes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you were in for a rude awakening on that one. <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, imagine the shock, right? But you know, I just. Uh, but like, those are kind of just been the morals that I've I've lived my life by, and uh, I tell everybody like it's they, they love to have me around because I'm a DD, right? Like, uh, I don't expect anybody to live the insane uh, life I've lived. Like, if you want to drink, please go drink. Good news is I'm here, so I can make sure you get back to the hotel safe, uh, or, or or whatever your vice is. Right, my vice just happens to be pro wrestling. And, you know, that's a great vice to have. I mean, it comes with its drawbacks too, but you know, the beauty of pro <laughs> wrestling is just—I mean, there's so many beautiful aspects of it, and that's kind of what this whole channel is going to be about—is you know, sharing people's stories, keeping people's legacies alive, but also just kind of reveling it because there's a lot of negativity especially in yes. wrestling media and yes. you know it's it's hard to avoid. it's it's not just wrestling it's life you know you're gonna find it everywhere but like for a lot of us pro wrestling has been our life one way or yes. another just as you were talking about and it like also another point you made it's like a melting pot you know people of all different cultures and races and orientations and upbringings like everything so many people from all walks of life gravitate towards it. it's not one demographic yeah, and it's funny because it, uh, I've, I've learned this through my life. Even the people that turn their nose up at wrestling always have the, well, I remember one time story, right? So oh, like, absolutely. Oh, oh, you do pro wrestling? That's ridiculous. Well, I remember when I was a kid, you know, blah, 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 blah. I was just like, well, why is this <laughs> ridiculous if you've got stories, you know? Like, it's okay to just like stuff. You're not going to get, like, I'm not going to get mad at you for just liking stuff. It doesn't have to be your passion like it is mine. You can just say, oh, that's cool. You know, like, yeah. it doesn't have to be your everything. It's, it's wild. But, like, everybody, I everybody has some kind of pro wrestling story. Uh, mm. You know, it's just, it's it's kind of just woven into the fabric of, uh of the nation now where, you know, again, it's not, not everybody's as insane as me and has, you know, gone back and, and watched every episode of prime time that they could get their hands on or, you know, studied Dusty's run in 85 to get to the hard times promo. 
Uh, I get that. That's cool. But like everybody's got that Dusty Rhodes story or the, the, that Randy Savage story or oh, whomever it may be. Uh, and that's part of the magic of pro wrestling. Yeah, that, that's kind of – that's the funny thing too is I'll, I've always encountered this thing where someone will find out about wrestling – and, you know, at first they're kind of almost standoffish about it. And then they'll be like, oh, but I can't believe this guy's the champion. Like when The Miz was champion, I got that a couple from two it, different people. They were like, oh, yes. I haven't watched that. But Miz is champion now. Huh? I can't believe what he did Monday. It's like you just said you haven't watched it since you were a kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it, it's always that way. But it's okay. Like, that's, you know, like I don't know why it's 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 everybody's dirty little secret. But, you know. Uh, I'm just I'm just the one that's not ashamed of it, and, you know. Happy, happy, just happy to be associated with it in any, you know. Like that's the there's still that part of me that gets those those butterflies in my stomach that like I can't believe, you know. If you would have told 13 year old me like this is the career you're gonna have, I would have I wouldn't have believed it. I wouldn't have believed it. You know, I'm a, I'm a lucky lucky dude. Yeah, and it's great that you can have that perspective because it's so easy to, you know, get lost in it when you're in it. You know, it's, it's, it's hyper competitive. There's a lot yes. of, you know, there's a lot of growth that people want. There's a lot of goals. There's a lot of pain. But for you to keep that perspective is great. Now, before we actually get to your first match, um, I did. There was one other thing I wanted to ask. Okay, so you didn't have like the formal training, but eventually, did you start training with anybody on a regular basis or? How did no, that so yeah, so like I didn't really like I kind of just got thrown in the ring after you know, and we 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 could touch that in a minute, but like I've never had like training day with somebody to teach me, uh, uh, specifically with that goal in mind. Now, there's been plenty of times, you know, I've taken advantage of situations and just been like, talk to me, tell me everything you know, you know, <laughs> like. But uh, I give credit. And, and I mean, and it's funny, I give credit to John Phoenix, uh, for training me. Uh, I was already three years, two years. I was, I was, I'd already been re working for two years before I even met John Phoenix. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, but I give him credit just because a, he's, he's just my dude. Like I'm a, I'm a loyal guy anyways. Like, uh, uh, and John's John's just one of he's one of my best friends to this day, and uh, I, I give him I give him credit because he helped open doors for me that nobody else was willing to. And that's huge. Um, now I also saw Jason Cross and Rick Michaels listed. Do you know why that is, or what story? Is there? Well, so Jason Cross and John Phoenix for a long time were synonymous with each other. Uh, and it's funny just because, like, yeah, I mean, we're talking 20 years ago. I'm still – I I spoke to all three of those guys today. Wow. You know, like, yeah, it's uh, – like I said, I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm almost loyal to a fault, but, like, if you're my dude, you're my dude. And uh, – but Cross, Cross is one of those guys that Phoenix would open doors, but I don't know if you remember Jason Cross from the TNA days – but he was the guy doing shooting star leg drops, which still to this day doesn't make sense to me. Like crazy athletic. Yeah. Crazy like athletic. it's not, I'll always say, cause you know, we came up in the wild side and we'll touch on that. But like cross was a better athlete than AJ styles ever was. Wow. AJ, AJ just wanted it more. Uh, AJ, you know, AJ got it more in his brain than cross did. But if we're talking just athletically gifted, Jason Cross was superior, and it wasn't even close. Uh, and then Rick was one of those guys that he ran the wild side school. And once I finally broke in there, he really took me under his wing. Like, I, uh, Rick taught me a ton. Uh, not, not so much holds. Or, you know, but the, the psychological side of things, Rick helped me out a lot. And Rick still helps me out a lot with, with stuff, you know. I'll call him with crazy ideas. Plus, he's, he does great gear. Uh, so uh, he's, he's one of those guys that uh, when I have a crazy idea for gear, uh, I'll touch base with him to see if it's even a possibility or if I'm 
<laughs> if if I'm fantasy booking how things are sold. <laughs> hey, there's a tip for aspiring wrestlers. You know, if you want to get gear, there's someone to seek out. Yes, yes, and uh, uh, house show gear on Facebook. He's my he's my current guy. Rick's busy doing famous people stuff. Uh, Rick does, you know, like the Charlotte Flares, and uh, he does a bunch of those. He did Flair's robe or Rick Flair's robe for the last match. Oh, wow. uh, he, yeah, yeah, he does like he does all our Cardona and Brian Myers gear. I mean, his list is insane, uh, and he gets he gets pretty bogged down with those guys. Uh, but the guy that does my gear, house show gear on Facebook, his name's Adrian Hawkins. Uh, he, I actually trained him to wrestle. Uh, it, it just incredible, incredible. Uh, and him and Rick talk, and especially when I come up with crazy, wacky ideas. So that's, <laughs> they're a good combo to have when I need them. That's great. Okay, so the big question, when was your first match and who was it? First, yeah, so my first match, the, the first match was in, uh, was, it was May 1st of 1998. We were at a show and they were short guys and said, Hey kid, you want to be in a battle Royal? Hey, I've never wanted anything more in my life. I can't. Do I want to be in a battle Royal? That's like asking if I want the Powerball number. Like, of course, yes. A million, you know, they're like, ah, well, we're kind of worried. Cause at the time I was only 15. Uh, Said, uh, do you mind going under a hood? I said, not a problem, dude. I'll go under six hoods. Like, what, <laughs> what are you talking about here? I'll literally do whatever. Did you and, have gear? Uh, no, I mean, I, I went to that show just like it was every other random show. So, like, I had they called me Snake Boy because I happened to have a snake mask, uh, that was given to me from the gimmick table. Uh, but I mean, it was. Snake mask, black shirt, warm up pants, and the shoes I wore to the show. I didn't have boots. I, you know, I fortunately I had knee pads because I was planning on you know training that day. So at least I had that much. But I didn't. I didn't even know to bring gear. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just uh, the the definition of indie outlaw pro <laughs> pro wrestling kid. Uh, but I was in a battle royal, and uh, it was it was the coolest moment of my life. I, I mean, and I was in and out probably four minutes. You know, uh, a couple of the guys let me do head scissors and, and a couple of high spots to them, and then they tossed me. And I, it was just it was everything I could have ever wanted it to be. Being in front of the fans for the first time, right? Like that's. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just, just. I mean, like, I, I, I pro wrestled. I did it. You know, <laughs> like that was like, especially because we're talking, you know, we're talking 1998, where even with the cruiserweights on WCW, you know, I'm, I'm 15 years old. I'm probably five, five, maybe, maybe maybe 105 pounds and 60 of that's hair anyways. Uh, so I've always, you know, I'd always heard like not going to happen. You're not, you're not, it's not going to happen. You're not big enough to be a pro wrestler. You're never going to be a pro wrestler just because especially then, you know, not that it, it still carries over to this day, but especially, you know, in that era, it was, you know, everybody was so preconditioned to, Six five, three twenty, jacked, uh, and I was just never going to be that. Uh, and so it was. Yeah, I I'd heard the boo birds forever. You're not going to be a pro wrestler. It's not going to happen. 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 Bam! I did it. One thing that's always crazy to me is you hear about Shawn Michaels and yes. even Shawn Waltman and Bret Hart being so small, and it's like. If you actually think about it, like they're heavyweights by today's standard, practically, right? Like, oh yeah, it, it, it's wild because I re like I remember the first time I met X Pac, and I was just like, I've been lied to my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's big, like he's like a legit six something, like right at six foot. Like what do 
what are these lines? It's 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 amazing to me, and it's you know it's the power of the magic of TV where you don't appreciate some of these guys' sizes because it's it's just monsters amongst monsters. The biggest human you will ever meet in your life is Billy Gunn. Oh, yeah, he just he's doesn't. Huge. Yes, he just doesn't ever stop being. He's just a giant mountain of a man. But you know when he's standing next to six six hunter and Road Dogs like six three, and it also it's just like one of these things where like I never appreciated how gigantic Billy Gunn was until I met him, and I was just like, oh, oh my god! And X Pac's the same way, Sean Walton's the same way, where it's just like, man, you really got boned by TV, you know? Like, <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's yeah, it's it's one of those it's one of those things where as pro wrestling has evolved it's amazing to me that uh a lot of those guys that i was told as a child were just tiny or actually large sized humans in any other world except for pro wrestling you know one of my biggest triggers like for a long time was scott hall referring to himself as the medium-sized man yeah and he's like what was he like six six something like that six six yeah get out of my face medium <laughs> man i'm wearing a medium shirt right now you would break all of this so with the size thing and you said you know you had heard it at that point already was it ever a major deterrent to you or was it something where you're like it doesn't matter i'll overcome it so uh i'll say it was delusional optimism as a child and as an adult i've kind of uh as I, it was never a concern, never, never once, because because nobody could ever love pro wrestling as much as I loved pro wrestling, right? So like, yeah. it, it doesn't matter. Didn't matter. Right? I, I could be two foot four. I, it didn't matter to me. I was going to, you know, like, it, I heard the boo birds. I under, you know, as I got older, I started to understand the logistics of it, but didn't care. I was like, okay, that's just. That's just my thing. I'm just going to be small. Uh, actually, like, being small kind of is what propelled the whole trajectory of my life. Because, like, like I said before, I was out on my own at 14. Uh, then once, you know, once I started to get to do a couple matches in May, you know, I did, I did the Battle Royal in May. Uh, well, right around the same time, my grandmother and grandfather on my mother's side, my grandfather had Parkinson's disease and uh, my grandmother had fallen ill and they lived in Macon, Georgia. Uh, and I had nothing to tie me to California other than that's where I was born. Uh, and uh, I had kind of, through my aunt, who was the conduit, uh, she had told me they really needed somebody to come help take care of them. And I said, well, hey, Macon's about an hour 15 south of Atlanta. WCW's got the cruiserweight division. At 15 years old, I decided, well, I'm just going to move cross country by myself to Macon, Georgia, so I can then go to the power plant and train with WCW and win the cruiserweight title foolproof plan great plan honestly <laughs> yeah i mean it's just I, I still to this day don't see a flaw in any of this logic <laughs> hey those are some big plans <laughs> i love it so you yeah, went to Georgia. Uh, how did you immediately have actually before we even go there were you wrestling regularly at this point when you moved over or was after the battle royal did you not really wrestle immediately after no, I didn't. I yeah, no. There was still. It was just one of those things that they were. They were just short guys. But I was still. I was definitely becoming part of the family. And I think had I just stuck it out, I definitely would have been, been used regularly. Uh, but it was just one of those things where, I had a gut feeling. You know, make this move. Uh, go, go to Georgia. You know. Go go beat Rey Mysterio for the cruiserweight title. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Uh, so yeah, no, it, there was no real regular bookings after that, and you know I still got to do the training bit, and help put up the ring, and all that stuff. 
Uh, and like I said, I got thrown a bone and it was, it was the thrill of my life up to that point. Uh, you know, I, zero, zero, zero bad feelings about any of it. They, I was never promised anything. Uh, but it's, not, it's not like they said, hey, put on this hood. And, you know, we'll put the title on you, kid. It was, can you do it? I did it. It was great. Uh, uh, but then I had that experience in my back pocket. So when I moved cross country, at least I had something like, oh, yeah, I've, you know, I've trained. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's kind of the benefit where you don't have to necessarily give all the details. You can just be like, yeah, I trained. I, you know, I got in the ring a little bit and I yep. did a show. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, the other thing is, you know, those that that one show because, ah, yeah, I've, you know, I've done a couple shows, and, you know, uh, you can name drop people that, again, this is 98. So Internet's limited. It's not like you can just look up a name on your on your phone immediately. So, uh, you know, when I, when I say, oh, I was, you know, I, when I say, you know, oh, yeah, Bill Anderson trained me or, you know, I trained with blah, blah, blah. It's not like you could look it up immediately and be like, no, he did it. Got that, me. That's something that's <laughs> wild to me, too. It's like in the past, promoters would hire people just from an 8 by 10 Like I remember in Chris Jericho's book, his first one, like he was talking yeah. about sending a 8 by 10 to Germany and it got him booked. And it, it, he got there, and the promoter was disappointed because he looked smaller than his eight by ten. But the yes. idea that like that's all you sent to someone, and it would get you—it's just it's, it's mind blowing in today's you know media focused you know oh one hundred percent yeah it's the, it's wild it's why it's just and it, it, getting to experience all of it too, just like you know, because I remember the eight by ten days. The, you got to have your matches on VHS, you know, so you'd go buy the five pack of, of blank tapes so you can record off your match to send it off here and send it off there just to where it is now where, you know, two, two clicks and a link is in everybody's hand that needs it. It's wild. So was NWA Wildside the first company you got in touch with when you were there or? No. So when I... Once I got here and got settled, uh, I kind of just got my feelers out to everywhere I could in Georgia. And again, I kind of just followed my pattern of just show up when shows were happening and kind of get to know people. There was a place, uh, there, was a, there, there was a family fun center called U.S. Play. Uh, that would would run Wednesday night shows, and uh, I'd I'd be up there all the time, and that's where I met a lot of guys that you know I I ended up you know just becoming some of my best friends in pro wrestling. But at the time, you know, I'm fifteen, sixteen, uh, just just trying to get my foot in the door anywhere I can. Uh, but I had always heard like from. From Jump Street, it was you know if you're gonna you want you want to get a part you want to be an NWA Wild Side you want to be an NWA Wild Side that's the place to be you know so that was kind of the back pocket goal like I want to I want to get there but uh, at the time you know I just I I wasn't ready for even even if that spot would have opened up I wouldn't have been ready for it uh, but uh, there was a show at a local fair right down right down the road from me and that was the first time i saw jason cross and i was just like oh my god this guy like he he was doing stuff that like i didn't even know a human body could do just blew me away so, so uh i hung out after the show and finally got to meet him it was just like dude i'm you know wow you know and i kind of told him like yeah i've trained a little bit but i'm trying to you know trying to get my foot in the door in places if you know anywhere and he gave me his email address uh so i got home and i emailed him immediately you know hey you know uh, sal I, you know, met you at the fair tonight you know big fan you know i would love to love to tag along with you to some shows and uh after about two months of pestering him he <laughs> he finally gave in said okay come Come with me. I've got a. I've got a show where uh, I need a manager. Am I managing? I said, I'll be whatever. 
And so uh, he was doing like a, a, a pretty boy gimmick. And I was going to be his French photographer, uh, Pierre Escargot. And, uh, you know, we, we, we did it one time. And uh, that night he wrestled Jimmy Rave, who went on to become my best friend. Uh, and, it, you know, he, he was, he was just kind of like, oh, wow. Like there's, there's, there's actually something there. You're not just talk. I was like, oh no, I can, you know, dude, I, I, I love this stuff. And he was like, okay, uh, you're going to be in the car with me from now on. Keep in mind, Jason Cross doesn't talk that clearly now. Uh, ever since there was a night at a, at a, at a place we used to wrestle called uh, good old days. He tried to do a double moonsault. And remember, this is the back in the 99. Uh, where he, pulling out a double moonsault wasn't something that just like, it was just unheard of. And for whatever reason, he opened wide on the first one and then tried to tuck on the second one and landed straight on his head. And ever since that day, he's kind of lost the ability to enunciate. <laughs> so he's he's very boom hour. You're gonna have to text me. I don't. <laughs> Those aren't words, buddy. I love you. Those aren't human words. Uh, but uh, yeah, J Jason threw me in the car, and I became his favorite opponent because I could take all his crazy high spots. You know, he's doing front flip on prettiers and. Uh, you know, like I could post for a brain buster and he could hold me up and he looked huge compared to me. Uh, and I had no fear laying there eating that shooting star leg drop or just whatever. Uh, and fortunately, one of my my strengths has always been having the ability to put a match together. So, you know, he would lay out the nine, ten things he wanted to do. and I would lay out when and why. And that was kind of just how our chemistry worked. Uh, and it was through him that at the end of 99, December, like right at New Year's, is uh, his best friend was John Phoenix. And uh, they were booked against each other. And that's where I met John. Actually, I met John's now wife, for, you know, a million years. I met her first because I was hitting on her. And she reminds me of that every time I talk to her. Never uh, let which you is, go. <laughs> which is frequent. Yeah. Which is <laughs> but uh, uh, I met John and John and I, I mean, instant chemistry. I mean, we just clicked immediately. Just uh, similar personalities, similar, you know, we, we laughed at a lot of the same things, which is probably not appropriate. Uh <laughs> But uh, we just got along immediately, and he at the time was at Wildside, and so he always told me, like, "Bear with me, we're going to get you in Wildside. I think, I think you could blossom there." Okay, and sure enough, he got me on summer in summer of two thousand. They were running like a house show. Because uh, Wildside would run TV's first and third Saturday of every month in Cornelia. And then the off weeks, they would try to fill it in. And they were running one of their house shows in Athens. And he said, hey, got a spot for you. And uh, he got me on. And I worked a bunch of... So at the time, Rick was running the school at Wildside. And he had a bunch of young guys... Uh, around my age, you know, we're talking 15, 16, 17 that were breaking in too. So, uh, they threw me in the ring with them and it worked. And they said, well, we also run the Friday night shows where like it was little to no pay, but it put your name on the board, you know, kind of got, it kind of got your, kind of got you at least noticed enough to where if they needed guys for the TV, they know you, they could use you. They know you're reliable. They know what you can do. And then uh, just, I think I started regularly at the Friday night shows in November of 2000. And uh, I never looked back. You know, that's interesting because 
that is something that a lot of times people have to do, and there are some who take advantage of it too, but sometimes you just need to get seen and show that yes. you're committed. And there are those who will take advantage of that, especially, you know, you know, there's some promoters in the past who have been very, you know, Oh, I'll get you next time, kid. But Absolutely. you know, <laughs> but in general, sometimes you gotta, you know, you gotta spend money to make money, so to speak, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And and it's not one of those things where I was never lied to. I was I was never once told like, hey, start here and we'll get you, you know, eighty bucks a night or whatever. And that, that they they were always upfront with with the money and everything. Like, hey. You're not getting paid in dollars. You're, you know, this, the trade-off is you're getting exposure, and because B- Bill Barons was was running Wildside, and the whole thing was like, I'm not going to pay you here in Cornelia, but when bookings, when outside bookings come, I can get you on those and get you paid, mm-hmm. and it was just it was understood. So. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many $20 nights I got from Wildside, but they never came as a shock. You know, I, I, there, were, there were definitely nights I wish I would have got a couple more dollars, but I knew what I was getting into. But like at the same time, you know, I was when I was there, when, when, when I started there, it was a WCW developmental ground. So like, I, I'll never forget it. I don't know if you know the building uh, in Cornelia, but uh, it's the most rinky dinky run down. You would never suspect this place to ever hold a human being, much less pro wrestling every other week. With so, I mean, there's so many names that have come through the doors of that building. Uh, and you couldn't find it on a map if it was circled and highlighted. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's also like it's they they nicknamed it years later the, the Church of Southern Wrestling, which is about as apropos as it gets. Uh, I mean, but like, so the first time I get to the building in Cornelia, you've got to walk up these rickety steps that were probably built by you know. Farmer Ted in 18 oct five, you know, like he just this is this is a safety violation in every way. You, I walk up these stairs to the back, and the first person I run into is uh is Bob Sack. Oh wow, who's sitting down in a chair and still looking down to see me because he's just a gigantic man. Uh, you know, I was just like, oh, this is a different world. <laughs> but like I mean it was a WCW developmental so that was like you know that's part of my master plan coming into play right like I'll get on at wild side I'll get noticed by WCW blah 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 I beat Rey Mysterio for the Cruiserweight title <laughs> <laughs> it's foolproof plan you know, it sounds like beating uh, Rey Mysterio for a title might still be your plan to this day. It's 100%. Like, that's the one, like, the king of the bucket list right there. I got to beat Rey for something. Uh, so, uh, when was your first time meeting Bill Barons? Because I know you mentioned that he got you in, or, well, obviously he would hire you. Uh, and what were your impressions of him early on? Because I know he's a figure who doesn't get as much appreciation. No, He's not really talked about it as much, but for those who knew him, they talked about him all the time. Yes. So Bill, uh, John, like I said, John Phoenix and I, you know, we, we developed this friendship. So uh, John had known Bill way before me. So John already had already, he had already put the seed in my head of what Bill was. Uh, so when I met Bill, uh, my first impression had already been planted here months before, but Bill was always, uh, he's got such a unique take on everything. And again, Bill's one of those guys that I just saw Bill Saturday. Uh, he's, you know, like, like I said, I'm, I'm loyal to a fault. Like if, if you took care of me, if you were good to me, I try to always remember that and take care of you and repay it in any way. Uh, I'll see Bill 
in two days, you know, at the, at the NWA shows, he's still running gorilla. I call it Baron's magic. Baron's always finds a way to appear. <laughs> like, I don't know how he does it, but Bill always finds a way to somehow still be involved in pro wrestling. And uh, the number of guys that he's influenced or helped out is astounding. You know, uh, AJ will always be at the top of the list. Just because mm. AJ was his prize pupil. He was the fair hair uh, stepchild. He was the one. But I mean, like I said, when I when I broke into Wildside, he had he had AJ, he had Paris, uh, Air Paris. Uh, at the time, uh, we we had a guy named Prince Justice who grew up to be Abyss. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was there, but I mean, uh, I mean, just there's again. Was Caprice it, Coleman there yet? Yes, Caprice Caprice was there, and uh, it's funny. Just I often forget at where where Caprice is now in the business, you know, like in my brain, Caprice is just sometimes that wild side guy. Cause there was a, there was a long lull where Caprice had vanished. Uh, and then he, you know, he popped up in ROH and started taking over the world, uh, which should have happened years prior, but and somehow I he digress. looks better than ever. Uh, he doesn't age. I, 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 I yell at him all the time for it. Like, come on, man. Like save a little of it for me. Like, <laughs> Now, our Maybe, truth, he was down there, but was truth, he? Yeah, was he already signed when you started? Like, how did that? Nope, nope. He was he was he was on his way out the door. Like, uh, he was he was getting ready to be uh, get the WWE deal and go be K Crush. Okay, uh, but so, but I mean, he's another one of those guys, you know. But like, we had especially with that WCW crossover, uh, Shane Helms and Shannon Moore. That's where I first met Jamie Noble, who I grew up, you know, who's still like every time I run into Jamie, it's a family reunion. Uh, I love Jamie to death. He's a part of one of my all time favorite wrestling stories, and we'll touch on that later. Uh, but just like, you know, those WC, that WCW crossover was all because of Bill. Bill's the one who knew Terry Taylor. Terry Taylor wanted something local to Georgia so they could send the power plant guys to. Uh, you know, so, but, and again, I'm, I'm reaping the rewards because of what Bill does. And I mean, Bill still, like I said, to this day, he's, he's awesome. I mean, he's, he's super duper agent to the stars. Uh, he's gotten, he's gotten me booked on a lot of stuff, uh, throughout, you know, throughout my 20 plus run, 20 year run now. Uh, you know, Bill's, Bill's, a, Bill's a dad to so many of us young guys, especially, uh, the, the crew that I came in with, uh, most of us had at least one parent not involved and Bill kind of became that father figure for a lot of us. So, uh, uh, yeah, Bill's awesome. He's just awesome. Sounds like a good dude and gave you a lot of opportunity. And you mentioned a lot of the talent who were there. I did want to ask this earlier, and I forgot. Who was the first real, like, wrestling star you encountered in person, like, at a show? And who was the first one you had a match with? Uh, it was so the first one. I mean, even at the time, he wasn't a star, you know. So uh, I would say the first person that I was just like, oh, he's TV famous, was probably David Flair. And it was that first night I was at Wildside. Uh, they, David Flair was there, you know, and he, this is, this is during his run with Crowbar, uh, and it just, it was cooler, cooler than the other side of the pillow on ice. Uh, just, uh, David Flair was awesome. Uh, my first, first name guy, uh, well, so it's, I would say the, it, it, their names to me, just because like I knew, you know, like I said, I was such a hardcore pro wrestling fan that like you'd be having, you'd, you'd, be, you'd have to be pretty slick to slide a guy by me. Uh, one of the very first things I did for Wild Side Television, it was a tag team gauntlet, and uh, we worked with the Cole Twins, who I recognized from WCW '93. And, uh, you know, we're talking, this is 2000 now. They hadn't been on TV for a long time. But I'm losing my mind because like, it's the Cold Twins. Like, 
does nobody understand how cool this is? Uh, the answer was no. Literally nobody cared. <laughs> no, I get that. I mean, I was that way with the heartbreakers, the heartthrobs. When, when yes, I, like, yes. It, it, it just, it's, it's funny, though, because when you are as in the bubble as, you know, you are and myself yeah. is, and, you know, hardcore die, diehard fans and those in the business who are diehard, you know, sometimes it's hard to even adequately explain, like, how over the top it is to Absolutely. people who don't understand. Absolutely. It's, it, it, it's very much, you know, one of those things where either you get it or you don't get it. And no matter what I can do, if you don't get it, no matter what I say to you, you'll just never get it. But if you do get it, I don't have to say anything. Yeah. Uh, and it connects, you know, and, it, but yeah, that was, that was the first time I was like, I was just like, this is, this is super cool. I'm wrestling TV guys. <laughs> so, it wasn't too long after this because what what point are we at now? We're in, probably breaking two thousand one, two thousand, two thousand one. Yeah. Okay, so this is when WCW and ECW are on the decline. Yes. From someone in the business at the time, even though you were still you know young and starry eyed and super popular, young. Yes. Did you see and did you know that they were going down while they were? And if no. not, or even if so, what was your reaction when everything was going on? Like, how did that affect the business around you? How did it affect you? So instantly, I didn't get it. Like, keep in mind, at Wildside, the night before Super Brawl, what was that? Uh, 10? It had to have been 10. The Super Brawl so. 1 was 91. So wh whatever the last Super Brawl was, 2001. It was Jindrak and Palumbo versus O'Hare and Stasiak uh, on the pay-per-view. The night before, they're doing that match in Cornelia to work out the Kings, right? So this is February of 01. So I couldn't have, I, like, even then, like, nobody thought, like, oh, WCW is going out of business. You know, AJ and Paris had just signed. Yeah. You know, so like not any of us ever thought like you, we heard the rumors that, you know, oh, WCW might be up for sale. But like, OK, sure. Heard that before. Never going to happen. You know, everything's fine. At the same time, uh, not too long before that tag match, Kid Cash and Jerry Lynn had come in to do a wild side shot and they were both asking around you know, other guys. And I just noticed, I just overheard it, you know, where they were asking other guys about work because they didn't think ECW was going to last long. And I was like, that can't be real. Like, no way. You know, I was just, we're talking about two stalwarts of my life. Like, yeah, 0% chance. And so when the news breaks that WCW has gone and Vince had bought it, and that ECW was gone. It was just, I was sh more shaken as a fan than I was a wrestler because I didn't even grasp, like, oh, there we, there's so many jobs that aren't available anymore. Yeah, you know, like that. That didn't hit me till later. It was genuinely as a pro wrestling fan, I was like, what the crap? Whoa, whoa, whoa no, 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 no. Like, no, what am I? What am I going to do on Thursday now? I can't watch Thunder. What am I you know, like? Were you an ECW is, guy, by the way? A huge ECW. I had guy. a feeling. But, I... Yeah, like I said, me and my brother fought over who got to be Sabu before we ever saw Sabu. Uh, it wasn't until I got I started doing that the, the shows in California where I found out about tape trading. Oh boy, yeah, like, yeah, and then you know, then I got to start getting my hands on this stuff, especially since. Those shows I was on, so Louis Spicoli was in and out of there. Oh, uh, so it, so honestly, if you want to, the first name I ever met was was Rad Rad was Louis Spicoli. Uh, uh so underrated. Yeah, he was the best. He was super. It was just like, oh my god. But like, so like, here's a guy I saw. I would see on a Saturday in you know California. And then I'd get a tape and he's giving, you know, Tommy Dreamer 
a Death Valley driver, which I'd never seen before, right? It was Spicoli driver, right? So it's just like, <gasps> this guy's completely changing the game, and he used to be a body Donna. Like, he's the best of all time. <laughs> Uh, just because the new generation's my era. Like, I love the new generation. I've got a story about that coming up. A yeah, little spoiler alert for those uh, tuning into the Hard Times pay-per-view this weekend. But, uh, yeah, so, like, it just it, – it didn't even make sense to me that, that ECW was gone, that WCW was gone. That means these jobs were gone. It meant I don't get to watch these shows anymore. Oh, no. And then it was, it was, so they both went down in March of 01. It was the summer of 01 where it kind of sunk in on me. Like, oh no. Like, there's nowhere to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, uh, Ray Mysterio doesn't have a job. How can I beat him for the Cruiserweight title? Like, <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it's it's definitely it's it's crazy how much the industry changes because you know a decade prior or maybe a little more than a decade prior something similar happened not to the same extent but you know the territory is starting to dry up and you had yep, all these yep. places that were starting to shut down and it was all and then everything got really healthy the industry was set on fire like practically never before you know at least yes, in a different way yes. and now suddenly everything was shifting again. Yeah, and it's crazy. Just, you know, the beauty of hindsight is when you were living it, when you were in that moment, when you were in the 96 and the 97 and WCW is on fire and people are genuinely like, oh, I think Vince is going to go out of business. Uh, it seemed like it was forever. But in the the grand scheme of things, WCW was hot for three years. It's just three years. You know, like, that's not – I mean, WCW – Turner bought it in, what, 89? Yeah. It made it, to, it made it to 01. You know, we're talking a little over a decade. That's crazy to think yeah. about. ECW now. was only around – Yeah. What, 93? Years, years. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy to think about how quick that is in hindsight. Because living in the moment, you know, like, I remember – Ordering barely legal and thinking ECW was about to take over the world. Mm -hmm. Four years later, they weren't in business. Yeah, Austin's it's run. Crazy. I mean, Austin's <laughs> run on top was, you know, oh, exactly. Three years, yes, and it was one of the greatest runs of all time. But it was only yes. three years. Yeah, it's wild. It's wild when you start putting numbers on stuff. Sometimes where it's just like this, this doesn't seem right, but it's. <laughs> it's as right as it gets. We were leaving off on everything, you know, everything shut down. The business was yeah. changing. And as scary as that is, you know, there's soon going to be changes in a different way. Because in the yes. next year, Ring of Honor pops up, TNA pops up. What yep. was on your radar first personally? T TNA was on my radar first only because the Shocker Barons was involved, right? <laughs> so, uh, so Thanksgiving of 2001, right? Yeah, Thanksgiving of 2001, I got booked to work for Burt Prentice in Nashville. And, uh, you know, B Bill had helped set that up and at the time i was teaming <clears throat> in wild side i was teaming with a, a young man by the name of seth delay and you know our combined age wasn't legal drinking age <laughs> uh <laughs> you know we were babies uh so uh when i got to wild side uh they had at they uh rick had asked me like hey do you what what, what what's your name and i was like uh you know, I had thrown a couple ideas out there, and I said one of the names I threw out there was Kid Ecstasy. And he goes, "Oh, that's perfect. I got a kid named Kid Cool. You mind teaming with him? You know, we'll come up with a team name for you guys later." So that's fine. So we tried it out on a Friday night show. And we just clicked. I mean, and, and Seth at the time was probably 
I mean, I would be shocked if he was fifth, if he was sixteen. There's probably I, I know he was fifteen because he wasn't able to drive yet. Uh, so he was kid cool. I was kid ecstasy. We were G rated, but the G stood for good looking. Uh, <laughs> and we often worked with like Rick's two prized pupils who uh, were the lost boys who, uh, yeah, again, I mean, same age range as us. Uh, I mean, not, I don't think any of us were 18 years old yet. Uh, and when, here we are Thanksgiving night booked to work the national fairgrounds for Bert. And I don't know if they knew, cause like outside of there, there was one guy in on the Lost Boys that, that was a wrestling fan growing up, and the other two just kind of fell into it. But like uh, Chad, who's the who's the the one I was closest to, I don't even think he grasped like what working the Nashville Fairgrounds on Thanksgiving meant, mm-hmm. right? And so like I'm losing my mind, and when we get there, we meet Bert, and Bert becomes a big fan of our match and, you know, asked us for more dates and had mentioned, well, you know, I also, I know Jeff Jarrett and Jeff Jarrett's talking about, you know, starting a new company. And I think he needs young talent like you guys. So this isn't, this is on my radar, November of Oh one. So I'm like, Oh my God, Jeff Jarrett, like I love double J. (laughs) Like, please let this happen. So at and this so, point, you weren't because like, there's always that thing where oh, there's this new millionaire backed promotion coming up, and they're almost never true. There's exceptions, but at this point, you weren't jaded enough to doubt it. You're like, okay, Jeff Jarrett, I know him. I know. Yes, yes. No, her. keep in mind that I was also so young that they <laughs> uh, they they could have used the fake millionaire name, and I've been like, this is the real deal. This is happening to me, but. Especially using the Jarrett name in Nashville, you know, like, plus I knew, you know, I, I'd known a Burt because I'd read about Memphis Championship Wrestling and Music City Wrestling. And yeah, I, I just, I, you know, I knew Christopher Love from Global. Like, I was familiar with who he was. Uh, so I trusted the word. And then uh, once, once the year turned into 01, and then the, the whispers kind of picked up and the whispers became talk and talk became yelling. And then like, Oh my God, this is really going to be a thing. And like, there was a show at the fairgrounds in March of Oh one that a bunch of us got booked on. And AJ was working David Young that night. Well, would it be O two? The... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I apologize. Yes. No it was O two. Uh, it was 02, but that's the night that Jerry Jarrett first saw AJ Styles. AJ worked David Young, and immediately, you guys are signed. Immediately. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you you guys, I mean, instant. And I had known them because they were wild side guys. So I knew, you know, like, I was like, oh, my God, this is a possibility. And then we went and did our match, and... Like, it was a pretty good match, and, you know, we were happy with it. Well, my buddy Chad, we get brought to the – when we're done, we get to the back, and we're kind of high fives, and, you know, thank you, thank you. We we had a good time. And uh, suddenly Chad's missing, and I was like, oh, wow, did Chad get a job? And uh, 20 minutes passes, and Chad comes back, and he's completely, I mean, just all the color sunken out of his face. And I'm like, hey, what's going on, man? And he goes, well, they uh, they asked me about coming to do something with Jeff Jarrett. I was like, dude, that's so cool, man. Like, well, obviously, part of me was like, I hate you. I <laughs> Of course, fight. I want to fight you for real. But like you know, like <laughs> I was, I was genuinely happy for him, right? Like, hey, dude, that's awesome. And he goes, yeah, there's a problem. But what's the problem? He goes, uh, they asked me if I'd get breast implants. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> he goes, yeah. I, uh, I went into Jerry Jarrett's office and he, he laid out this whole idea where like. 
I'm going to be a dude, but I'm going to get breast implants because the only way I can get noticed is if I was a female and not a male. And I was like, I don't understand because you're not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> that that's that's the leap in logic right there. <laughs> yeah, like I'm I was one of the, the whole boob thing. Yeah, I'm with you there, but uh, you're not pretty. <laughs> like I'll, we we can put lipstick on this pig, but it's still gonna be a pig, buddy. <laughs> but he was like, I don't know what to do, and I was just like, Oh wow! So like in my brain, that's the thing where I was like. This is 100% a real deal. If they're pitching ideas like that, like this thing's full boogie, I got to be a part of this. Uh, and so I kind of stayed on Bill pretty regularly. Like, hey, you know, what's up with this Jarrett thing? What's up with this Jarrett thing? What's up with this Jarrett thing? You know, I'd stayed on Bert. You know, what's up with this Jarrett thing? And then I got the call. Uh, hey, you're booked in Alabama. It's going to be the first it's going to be the, the first pay-per-view and they're taping the second one. And so I'm like, Oh my God, this is really happening. So, uh, it's, it's never on any of my Wikipedia pages or anything. Cause I didn't do anything that night, but I was booked as extra talent. Uh, keep in mind, nobody ever told me I was extra talent. They just said I was booked. Yeah. Uh, which, which was heartbreaking when I got there and I realized, Oh no, like I'm not doing anything. <laughs> that's the worst like at the time thought, it had to be a blow oh it was 100 percent. just because like i said i i had never they didn't tell me i had something but they didn't tell me i didn't have anything so no. i i kind of thought i was being brought in as talent and but like dude there were so many guys there that it was just like oh, this is cool. Like, I definitely want to be a part of this, especially since the sales pitch I got from the TNA end was always, well, look, wrestling fans are paying $90 a month for pay-per-views between WCW, ECW, and WWE. That marketplace is dead. It's just the WWE. So we're asking for $10 a month. You're still essentially saving $20 a month. And in my brain, I'm like, all those numbers add up. Yeah. What I didn't take into account was nobody was buying the WCW pay-per-views and the ECW pay-per-views. That's why they went out of business. That's a good point. <laughs> and there was no television to promote the yes. show, you know? Yes, that. yes. So who was uh, your first contact into, like, besides, like, talking to Bird as a kind of, like, did you talk to Jeff? Did you talk to Jerry? Did you talk to... No, I... I, I, I I didn't speak to either one of them till the day of the show. And right. it was just, it was just, hi, I'm Sal. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. know, we'll let you know if we got anything for you, you know? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You know, uh, it was, it was, Bill was always my point of contact. All right. Uh, but, and, uh, you know, and it was just crazy. Cause it was just like, I knew AJ personally. I'd been in cars with AJ. I, you know, cracked jokes with AJ. I, you know, I'd heard AJ fart. And now here's AJ hanging out with Scott Hall. You yeah. know, and it's just like, oh, this is a weird dichotomy. <laughs> like, this is not normal. Like, you know, Jeff Jarrett, who, like, even as a kid, I was a huge, I was for real a Jeff Jarrett fan. So it's not like, eh, like, oh, I hated this guy, but now I want him to like me. Like, no, as a kid, I was like, I loved the Double J gimmick. I loved the country guy. So, like, <laughs> to be in the same building with him and, like, seeing one of my friends, like, have regular conversations with him blew me away. Like, I just total you know it was it was starstruck it was it was hunger because like i wanted that i wanted to be there i wanted to be a part of this thing uh it was it was it was super super cool you know and uh and i got brought back i did a bunch of of different spots for tna those those early years man if you go back and review the pay-per-views, I can't tell you how many fights I stopped from happening. 
Very poorly, by the way. I'm a horrible security guard. Yeah, it seems like the security never really do their job pretty well these days. Yeah, I'm really. It's. I actually at one point I had. Uh, I. It was after one of my WWE security spots where I failed miserably, and I think I got the McMahon's beat up or something. And I said, "Man, I, I want to put together like a vignette." of just a series of vignettes of me trying to get back into the game. Like I've hit rock bottom as a security guard and I've let everybody that's ever hired me down. And now I'm the over exuberant security guard that's securing stuff that doesn't need to be secure. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Until I finally get the confidence and I get the call, you know, one more shot one more chance to be a security guard for somebody that matters. And then of course, you know, it would just tie it into a, a WWE or a TNA extra spot that goes awry again. I'm just like, that's it. I quit. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, so I don't know of every match you had in TNA, but I know it said in 2002, you had one with Conan. Was that? Yeah. Because Conan, obviously, like, first of all, he was huge in WCW, but he was even bigger in Mexico. How was yes. that? Like, was it the first was... time meeting him? Or, uh, no, no, just I actually, uh, I don't remember the line. I think I did a couple matches because I know I did a couple matches with three live crew. I don't remember if one came before the singles with Conan. Uh, my note says Conan was 2002 and three live crew was 2003, but I could, uh, but you know, it doesn't mean it has everything, you know. It doesn't have dark matches. It doesn't have everything. Yeah, 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 no, because I definitely worked three live crew like three times. Yeah. Uh, so if it's only showing one, then uh, I know <laughs> that's incorrect. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it was definitely my first singles match with Conan, and I was I couldn't have been more excited. You know, like, again, a uh, huge I – mean, I'm a wrestling nerd. I'm a self-professed huge wrestling nerd. So, like, I had known Conan. For a long time, you know, like he had been, he had been in my life for a long time at that point. So just like, oh yeah, you're just going to do a singles match with Conan. I'm just like, oh, this is freaking insanely awesome. Uh, and it was super cool. And uh, I made sure when he did the Rolling Thunder or what was it, the, the clothesline. Yeah. Uh, when he did the Rolling Clothesline, I made sure to take a flip bump off of it instead of just a regular one and when we got to the back he was like oh man thank you so much for that like you know you that you know that's really cool that you did that for me and i'm like dude you just hit me with your rolling clothes yeah <laughs> i don't think you understand how cool that is <laughs> internally you're just ready to explode in joy yes yes like it was just it was it's one of those surreal moments where you just like uh, and fortunately it's because of, of stuff like that early on where like, I got to work with the Conans and I got to work with road dog and I got to work with crush. And, uh, it's there. It's early. It's early on in my run that I got to take, I learned to take the step back and appreciate the moment while I was in it instead of waiting to appreciate it later because it might not ever happen again, you know? So, like, I very distinctly remember taking that flip bump from Conan, hearing the crowd's reaction, and thinking, yeah, I, that was cool. Like, this is this is a very, very cool moment. Now, those bumps are uh, great. And especially when Rikishi, of all people, would take that. Yes, line. Stupid. Dude, <laughs> stupid. Insane. Massive, and he, he did it beautifully. Beautifully. Yes. Like, yes. So, you... You mentioned Truth and Road Dog also. Now, with uh, Kate Cross, Truth, Ron Killings, you met him before he got signed, and this was when he came yes. back. Did you talk to him a lot before he got signed, or was it more of just like, hey, how are you, kind of? No, yeah, no. I mean, he was literally out the door as I was coming in. So, I mean, we had definitely said our hellos and, uh, you, you know, shared pleasantries. But, like, I was just another face in the crowd. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, like, there was also that connection just because he'd seen me interact with AJ. Mm -hmm. And so he, 
he, he knew that there was some kind of connection there. Uh, so like truth was to this day, I just saw him a couple weeks ago at raw. I mean, he's always been over the top. Very, 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 very cool with me. Uh, which is, it's weird. It's wild, but it, it's just like, dude, you're you like, yeah. you're forever over. <laughs> like, <laughs> speaking of a guy who doesn't look his age at all. Oh, no, wow. no, he he just quit aging. He just he turned in his notice, so not going to do it. And <laughs> aging accepted it. Said, "All right, that's cool. You don't have to. You're 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 omit from aging ever." We'll probably cover a lot of stuff if we do. If I'm fortunate enough to have a part two, but I do want to talk about you know your recent raw appearance before tonight's over because oh, that yes that one. Very interesting. But um, I want to know what it was like working with Road Dog because I know this wasn't his best time period. He he had his struggles, but I don't know if it was apparent. No, well, it was a given. Like we all kind of knew, but at the same time, it wasn't it wasn't bell to bell. It wasn't it, his issues weren't anger or anything like that. So like when it came to the match, like I said, I worked with them quite a few times to the point where the last time I did a three live crew match, truth, uh, truth and road dog said, Hey, who are your partners? And I was like, ah, you know, whomever they were, I was like that kid, that kid, they go, all right, you figure out who's taking what and just let us know. You know, like, uh, <laughs> Uh, just because the, the those those uh, explosion matches for three live crew were pretty rinse wash repeat, right? It was just what guys taking the the punches, what guys taking Conan shoe, and what guys doing the up and over spot with Truth. Yeah. So, so it was kind of like you know what did I want to take, and then who wants to fill in the blanks for the other ones? Uh, That's not a bad spot so, to be in, though. You know, to be kind of almost the lead on that end. Absolutely. They this thing is, yes, they trusted me. And like just the explosion matches, because like there's I did quite a few that for whatever reason didn't make air. I remember three weeks in a row. One week I worked uh Jimmy Rave. The next week I worked Jason Cross, which was like one of those like, man, this is cool. Yeah. Like, you know, this is just me and the dude that I used to travel the roads with, and here we are at TNA. And then the next week it was a six man where it was, and I cannot remember the teams to save my life, like who was on what team, but I know it was me and Matt Seidel and Delirious and Jimmy Rave and like Matt Seidel, one of Matt Seidel's trainees and Shark Boy. And after every, this this is really was part of the wool of pro wrestling started getting pulled over, you know, unveiled from my eyes. Where I did the Jimmy Rave match and we, we got to the back and Jerry Jarrett was sitting in Gorilla and he goes, Boys, that may have been the best explosion match I've ever seen. And Jimmy and I were both like, Oh my God, we're about to get signed. And then the next week, I did the Jason Cross match and I get to the back and Jerry Jarrett looks up and goes, Boys, that might have been the best explosion match oh, I've ever Lord. seen. And I was like, oh, uh, All right, cool. I'm <laughs> Did he ever bring up a chicken salad recipe? No, not once did I get in. <laughs> no kind of, no kind of grapes or anything. Like, come <laughs> on. Uh, and then the next week we do the six man, and I walk to the back, and he, uh, he kind of looks up and he goes, "Boys," and I go, "Let me guess, best explosion match you've ever seen." And he goes, "You took the words out of my mouth." <laughs> yeah, the <I'm> feeling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was good. You're right, Jerry. It was good. <laughs> Classic good match, kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Work on your footwork, kid. Sure will. Oh, that's great. Uh, but yeah, I mean those are those are those explosions, you know, all that TNA stuff. Again, like these my favorite one of my favorite TNA moments at the fairgrounds. It was the first time Wolfie D and Slash had seen each other in a long time. And again, huge new gen fan. Like new generation is just like my favorite era of pro wrestling. Like I love the WWF new generation. So PG thirteen in the early nation of domination. Yes, 
Yes. So they're talking and I'm just like, oh, oh my God. And then they start doing the nation thing, <laughs> which I know, you know, like, so like, we all the nation live and in color. Don't diss the man or we'll bring us your mother. But like, they're doing it. And I'm like, oh my God, why is nobody here? Like, why don't I have a cell phone with a camera on it to record this? Oh, because it's 2003 and those aren't things yet. In that moment, you're uh, probably like that classic uh, gif of, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's that fan when the nation of domination comes out and he's this guy with glasses yes, and he has his yes, fist raised up in the air. Yes. Hilarious yes, gift. Just Yes. Uh, and I'm, uh, but I'm losing my mind and there's nobody there with me to appreciate it. I'm like, come on. Uh, but yeah, I got to see Wolfie and JC Ice do the nation thing in the back. And I was just like, I've peaked. It's <laughs> it's all downhill from here. Did you have a lot of interactions with Jamie Dundee besides that? Because he has quite the reputation, you know. Yeah, he's he's just a wild dude. I I've had a like I said, I was doing stuff for Burt, uh, and I would do Nashville stuff. So uh I I've seen plenty of wild Jamie nights where it's just like, oh, that's not anything a human being should do. Yet here we are and he's doing it. <laughs> you know, I didn't even think about it. When you were doing that, uh, were you like in Memphis much when Lawler split from WWE for that 2001 during that period? No, but he did come. He, uh, uh, Barons did get him to come to Wildside. Him and uh, him and uh, the cat came down to Wildside. All right. Uh, so uh, I did. I did get to meet Lawler there. Uh, and again, that's one of those like, oh, that's. That's the king of Memphis wrestling. Yeah. That's that's the dude. Like that's you know, one of the voices of my childhood. For my money, <laughs> the greatest punch in pro wrestling. Yes, well, billion percent, yes. Uh so yeah, that that was cool, but yeah, no, I did uh just because Memphis is just on the other it's way on the other side of Tennessee. Memphis yeah. is on the Arkansas side. So uh at the time I was about five hours from Nashville. So you'd have to put on probably another it'd probably be about a ten hour trip to Memphis. That's a big trip. <laughs> That's a big yeah. trip. Yeah. Yeah. So another thing you did in TNA, which I find very interesting, is it was you and Antonio Banks against uh America's Most Wanted. And yes. Antonio Banks went on to become MVP. Yeah, so we actually just talked about that at Raw. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I'll always give him the credit for it. It's just something small, but, like, uh, it was just one of those things where we were both trying to get a look, you know. And uh, right before we go out, Banks – and I had known Banks from Florida Indies anyways – uh, cause I, by that point I had already started traveling, traveling pretty heavily. Uh, you know, I was fortunate enough, uh, God bless, you know, uh, J Jimmy Rave always helped me, uh, get my name out there. Cause again, going back to the do as I say, not as I do, uh, training techniques, nobody ever taught me about sending out tapes. Nobody, nobody told me about sending the eight by tens. So my first couple of years, I didn't because mm -hmm. I didn't know. I just didn't, you know, I just thought promoters would hear about your exploits and book you. I didn't understand you had to put in the work to get booked. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy was one of the first guys that he, you know, that kind of showed me like, oh, no, no, no. Got contact this guy here and send this here. And, uh, you know, he, he really, really, really went out of his way to help me in that aspect. But like I said, so I had known Banks anyways, and literally right before we walk out, he goes, hey, you want to do something just to see if we can catch their eye? Like maybe here I come, I'm big and bad, and then like you stop me and cut me off and preen for the camera or something. And I was like, oh my God, character work. That's my favorite stuff. Yes. And it was just something small that uh, did, it actually got picked up on the Fox Sports when they aired it, which I thought was super cool, but it was just one of those things where like Banks has, he's always had a, a mind for what to do when the camera's on. When that, when, when that lights on, you know, 
he knew he knew how to turn it up even way back then. Uh, but uh, like I said, I just saw Banks at Raw a couple weeks ago, and uh, when we were when when he realized because I had already spoken to Omos when when he walked up and he was like, "Oh, you." You're, you're working with that guy tonight? He goes, yeah. And he was like, oh, you got to take care of Sal. He's He was my tag team partner back in, you know, 1992. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. But, yeah, he just – he had star presence, you know, and still obviously yeah, – still Immediately. Day, just... Yeah. And it's one of those things where, like, when the guys, you know, uh, you, you've always heard the stories about guys rebooking the territory when they're in the cars going from town. And uh, when FIP first started running hot and heavy with Gabe, uh, Banks was one of those guys that, like, when he would be brought up, I'd go, oh, I can't even fantasy book this guy. He's not long for this world. Like, he's wow. going to be signed. He's going to be signed. You know, yep. like, you, you just knew it. I mean, he had the size. He had the look. He had the ability to talk. He had it. Uh, and, I mean, he's – if anything, he proved me correct. Yeah, <laughs> the guy, the four guys in that car is like Sal nailed it on that one. <laughs> you know, a guy who I had that opinion of it much later, and I think in a way it might have slowed down his push in Ring of Honor was Dijak, because here's yes. a guy he's huge, he's in great shape, he's a tremendous athlete, and it seemed like he was never really pushed in some of the bigger companies. And then I, he was signed. I think everybody knew it's like, well, we can only push him for so long because. He's going to be out the door. Yeah, he's gone. Yeah, 100%. I, I couldn't agree with that very more. Yeah. So, you, like I said, you worked AMW. What was it like working with Chris Harrison, and James Storm? Because I'm guessing there are another two guys who you worked with. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was, yeah, that was, it, it was a night off. I, I mean, James Storm, like, so J, whenever James Storm is mentioned to me, my first thought always goes back to, like, Burt had us do a couple, uh, a couple uh, like angles together, and one of them was uh, we did a cage match. And at the time, this this is pre TNA. Uh, at the time, Storm was coming out to Cowboy by Kid Rock, but he wouldn't hit. He wouldn't come out the curtain until the chorus hit. <laughs> well, that first verse, the intro, that first verse, are like a minute and a half, two minutes. So, like, as a heel, you would come out and you would get your heat, and then you would just have to sit and wait forever. <laughs> like a raw commercial. Yeah, it's just like, oh, come on, James. Got it. You're a cowboy, baby. Let's go. Like, giddy up. Uh, and that's that's always my first thought when I think of James Storm. That's such a funny thing. The, yes. It's just, he's just standing in the ring just waiting. Like, I hate this song. <laughs> Even if I liked this song, you've made me hate this song. <laughs> it's such an indie wrestling thing, too. It, because absolutely, like, sometimes it's done where it's great. Like Brian Danielson, like with the final countdown, is like final the countdown. Yes. Funk with um AFI, I think it was. Yeah, and it's like yeah, there, there was this momentum. But and then once people saw it was working, everybody wanted to do it. So you had everybody yes. waited like a minute and a half or a minute to come out for the right part of their song. Yes, no, and and I because I've always been the opposite. We're like, I, I'm a, I'm you know, I, I like music just like everybody else, but like my entrance music is no, there's very, very, very few times where I'm like I've got to have the right entrance music, like it's got to speak to me. Like nine times out of ten, especially you know, especially before the. the 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 modern era where you could just tell somebody a song and they can pull it up out of the cloud via magic you know when you i can't tell you how many times i show up to shows and like hey you know we need a cd for your music i'm like i don't just play whatever i don't care like as soon as as soon as i hear a sound i'm coming through the curtain anyways you know like i don't need i don't need specific music to to get me going uh and so just having to sit in the ring for a month and a half while Kid Rock is strumming through the first chorus of Cowboy, like this is this is some weird kind of torture. I don't know what karma I put out into the universe to make this my punishment, but it must have been real good. Cause 
I'm paying all of it back right now. Did he have those cap guns at the time? 100%. Yes, yes. Oh, that was great. <laughs> yes. But, yeah, him and Harris were just a phenomenal tag team. And, you know, I really, I had big expectations for Chris Harris. And, you know, things happened the way they happened. Everybody did. But Everybody did, yeah. I kind of thought he was the standout when I was younger, just without knowing better of the two. Like, Oh, yes. Well, unquestionably. But when AMW were together, Chris Chris was Sean and and Storm was Marty. Yeah. Nobody knew that they were going to flip-flop. Yeah. Keep in mind, too, as a kid, I thought Marty was the guy. <laughs> Marty did the rocker drop where he was way cooler. So, like, I miss a lot on these tag teams is what I'm trying to say. That's another thing, though. Marty is such, was such a phenomenal wrestler. Man, he was, yeah, it he was, was great. I've got, one, of the, one of the best compliments I've ever gotten in pro wrestling was, was an offhanded comment by Marty one day. Uh, so Marty lived in Columbus, and at the time, Jimmy Rave lived in Columbus. And I was in town. I was picking Jimmy up. We were headed off to a show. And I called him on the way there. I was like, hey, man. Do you have a gym I can get into? You know, I'm 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 gonna get there super early. I'd like to, you know, maybe maybe get a lift in and tan. He's like, oh yeah, you know, so he gives me his gym information or whatever. So I work out, I go tan, and when I get out of the tanning bed, who's there waiting? Marty Janetti. I'm like, oh, and he just looks up and he he sees me, and I'd met Marty plenty of times before, but still, it's Marty Janetti. Yeah. Uh you know, and uh, I, I walk out and I see him and he goes, man, I should have known it was one of the boys that was in the tanning bed. And I was just like, oh, Marty Janetti called me one of the boys. I've made it. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, man, that's amazing. So, you know, I we probably will have to start wrapping things up a little bit, but I still want to talk about a little more with TNA, specifically one thing, and that's Jeff Jarrett, Slammiversary. That's what happened a, there. Yeah, he's a real, real piece of work that Jared is. Uh, Still to this day. Yeah. No, it's one of those things where uh, I got called last minute. Uh, I was, I was at a show Saturday night, and I got the phone call. Hey, can you be in Orlando? And I knew it was pay per view weekend, and I'm like, oh my god. <sighs> You know, I'm thinking, you know, there's some X Division scramble or something because they always had stuff like that where they were calling guys at the last minute. All those X Division guys I knew, you know, they're just they're guys that I came up through the indies with, the, you know, the Shelleys and the, the Sanjays and the just all of them. Like I'd known those guys. And uh, they'd always, you know, I, I'd seen them firsthand like, hey, you, you should find something for Sal. Sal can. Sal would really work out well here. Uh, and probably two weeks before that, I did an indie with Petey. And uh, Petey was super excited after the match. He was just, oh, my God, I could do that on TV right now. And I was like, well, I don't have that say. I will let you do that on TV. <laughs> yeah, <heartbeat. laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying no, Peter. I'm, <laughs> I'm saying you make it happen. I'll be there. So then I get this call, like, hey, can you be in Nashville? It was, uh, uh, it was Dutch that called me. Hey, can you in Nashville? Uh, Orlando. Can you be in Orlando? Absolutely. So I get there, and uh, at this point, like, Jarrett knows my name, which to this day still blows my mind. Like, some of these guys that, like, have no right knowing who I am call me by name and it's just like what what's happening here right like that's not how this is like what is life my baby and, uh, tonight is yeah no like I, yeah like i bought that tape i bought that cassette and like this dude's now just like hey sal i got something for you tonight like what is happening <laughs> and so but like you know i go down with you because they didn't they didn't give me any idea of what I was doing. They just said I had some. So I'm thinking, oh my God, maybe, you know, maybe this is it. Maybe I'm an X Division thing. And Jeff pulls me aside. He goes, You a fan of Jeff Hardy? <laughs> I was like, oh. 
wow, this is left field. Yeah, right. I go, yeah, sure. I mean, who doesn't like Jeff, right? Like Jeff's, Jeff's the coolest of the cool. Uh, you can't breathe and not like Jeff Hardy. And right. He goes, good. Because uh, you're going to dress up him like him tonight. I'm going to beat you up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what? And he goes, yeah. And, and he, the thing is, like, Jeff was always transparent with me, which was weird. But he was just like, yeah, they're, uh, <clears throat> they're doing King of the Mountain tonight. And uh, they want me to lose, which makes no sense to me because I'm the King of the Mountain. So I have to Great get myself. Line. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, so uh, so I got to get myself taken out of the match. And I was like, okay. He goes, yeah. So uh, we're going to do a spot, you know, where you're going to be dressed like Jeff in the crowd. You're going to you're, you're be a little too aggressive. When I'm walking by, I'm going to pull you out. I'm going to hit you with a guitar. And I'm just like, man. I guess I'm not doing the X Division match. <laughs> but I'm also like, man, I get to eat a guitar shop from Jeff Jarrett. Like, <laughs> that's insanely cool. Like, kind of like a dream come true you never necessarily knew you wanted. But yeah, no, it's, it's not. It was never a bucket list item until I was told I got to do it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, 100%. That's what we're doing. Uh, Especially since, like, at that point, like, I, I'd, I'd known, I'd, I'd got to meet Jeff, and like, Jeff was genuinely one of those guys that I was like, man, he's, he's so cool. He doesn't even know how cool he is. Like, he's a for real, living, breathing rock star. Where like, I've seen grown men well up in tears because they got to meet him, right? So like, and Jeff's just like, yeah, man, that's cool. I'm like, no, that's a huge deal. Like. <laughs> I know you're you, but like that's a huge deal for us normal humans. Uh, so yeah, we you know we, we we go out there, we did the spot, and he blasts me with a guitar, and I'm just like, yeah, man, yeah, I'm like Beetlejuice, <laughs> I'm like May Young, put me on the list. Like oh, this is what a perfect is, what tr what a trio right there. Yeah, right. Yeah, May Young, Beetlejuice, uh, your pal self. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we were we were probably going to be uh, in the Chikara Trios tournament uh, one year. Just get... <laughs> definitely the winners of the King of Trios. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Not even, not even close. Uh, but yeah, no, it was just it was super, it was super cool, you know. And it was just one of those things. Like, uh, it's funny because I did it, and it was a very cool moment. And then I completely forgot about it. Uh, Till I did a podcast, uh, I'd say about two years ago when somebody brought it up. And, you know, as soon as they brought it up, the light bulb went off. And I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, man, that's cool. I did that. You know, and that's one of the things I love about doing these podcasts is you guys do some research and you'll remind me of stuff that I completely forgot I got to do. Like, like I said, I'm a very, I'm very lucky. I'm very blessed that, like, I've got such a laundry list of stuff that I've got to do that sometimes stuff just slips through the cracks until I rem I'm reminded about it. I'm like, oh man, yeah, that's that's another really really cool thing that I got to experience. Like on live pay per view, I got to be pulled out of the crowd and hit with a guitar from Jeff Jarrett. Like that's awesome. It's just it's such a cool situation, and if you put it into perspective, like the last couple of people we were talking about, you know, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Hardy, uh, Conan, yeah. Road yeah. Dog. And like it, 10 years prior to this, you were the biggest fan in the world. And half of them Yo, were people I, you watched weekly. You know? Yes, those were guys I was at Toys R Us buying their figures of. You know, like couldn't wait to buy them. Couldn't wait to spend that money. And now like we're peers. Like that's insane. <laughs> And not only are they your peers, but they trust you enough to let you put stuff together and yeah. do what you do. Like, like at that point, because it, it's just, it's a special situation. It's very cool, very cool. Yeah, no, and it's 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 one of those things that I you know I genuinely don't try to take for granted. And it just like, uh, I mean, you, we could fast forward to this year. I worked Matt Hardy. Uh, I did a singles match with Matt Hardy, and I basically put the whole thing together. And in the middle of the match, 
we're doing Matt's comeback and he's giving me the 10 delete head to the turnbuckle. Mm -hmm. And in the back, he had mentioned, you know, I want to do 10. And I was like, I bet we could get all four buckles. Oh, wow. You know? And he was like, you think? I go, dude, they're going to be with it. I promise you. And he goes, okay, we'll try it. You know, if they're not with it, we'll cut it short. I'm like, absolutely. And when we're headed to the third buckle, you know, Matt's got me by the head. He goes, I'm having the time of my life. And I was just like, how does any of this make sense yeah. at all? Like, I'm in the ring with Matt freaking Hardy. <laughs> like, <laughs> Pitching something to him that he loves. That yeah. Works. Yeah, and he's he's in mid match. I'm having the time of my life. I'm like, what? Is life that your is first so time weird. wrestling, Matt Hardy? Yeah, that was yeah. Very cool. How was uh, he overall? Like, uh, cool guy. Beyond, beyond the best. I mean, just it was one of. It, like, I can't even. I can't even really summarize it in words. It's just like one of those. Everything you wanted it to be, or everything I wanted it to be, it was that time six. You know, it was it, it was just so stupid, cool. We're like, I pitched, I pitched an idea for the finish. You know, like Matt came to me, he was like, "What do you want to do?" And I was like, "Uh, well, you're Matt Hardy, so I'm going <laughs> to just fall down for you." Is how that's going to work. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Do you have ideas? And my the big idea that – the only thing I was really married to that I really wanted to do is like uh, now that I'm doing this crazy thing, I sit and I clap and I rock. Yeah. So I was like, hey, uh, so, you know, so I'm laying this out. Like I sit and I clap and I rock. I go, what if I hit you with the twist of fate and when we land – Instead of me taking a back bump, I'll land in my butt and I'll sit and clap and rock and you no sell it, you know? So you just stand over me and you start doing the delete, you know, while I'm sitting and clapping and rocking, I turn around, boot me, twist the fate, one, two, three. And he goes, oh my God, yes. He goes, I'm never on that side of the no sell. He goes, I'm always, I'm always the guy that's having to hit the move and the, somebody else no sells it because I've never got to do it. I was like, oh, my God, well, tonight's your night, kid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> dream the dream. It's real. Uh, and so he was like, well, what else you got? I'm like, uh, well, what if we do this? What if we do this? And I got this. And it's literally me just pitching ideas. And Matt just, oh, my God, I love that. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, yeah, we can do that. And I'm just like, this is on freaking real, right? Like. Uh, especially since I got to bring my son and he's losing his mind. Cause like one of my all time favorite moments as a dad and as a wrestling fan was, uh, I took my boys to WrestleMania 33 and that's when the Hardys came back, mm. uh, in the ladder match. Thunderous and, reaction. Well, somehow I had been able to block the thought from even entering their mind. Like, it had been openly discussed, like, ooh, I think the Hardys are coming back. But for whatever reason, it didn't click with them. They didn't hear it. So, uh, Xavier Woods, who's family, I mean, my kids call him Uncle Austin. Like, he's family to me. Uh, he's part of the, you know, he's he's out there doing the, the cell job right before the Hardys come out. And I remember Jacob, who's my youngest son, who's the wrestling fan. My eldest son doesn't care. Uh, but, uh, Jacob, who's, I mean, he's mini me. I mean, just, he lives, breathes, dies off this pro wrestling stuff. But as they're doing this promo, he looks at me, he goes, do you think uncle Austin's going to be in this match? And I was like, I don't know, baby. He goes, man, that would be cool. I can't think of anybody cooler. And then that, and I mean, we're in an outdoor stadium and the place is literally shaking and just looking over and watching it dawn on my boys. It's the Hardys. They're here and they're in this match and then watching them progressively lose their mind. Like everybody else in that stadium. 
Uh, it's just one of my all time favorite wrestling moments and favorite dad moments. And then you fast forward a couple of years and I'm telling Matt Hardy what he's going to do in his match. Incredible. Right? Like, you can't write that kind of stuff. Do you remember what company this was for? Uh, AML. AML, okay. Because I wasn't sure yeah. if the match was out there for people to check out. Uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I, I, it might be out there. I don't, I, I'm also insane and I can't ever watch myself. So <laughs> it's possible the match is out there. I'll just never watch it. <laughs> Still super cool, super cool. All yes. right. Uh, I've kept you for a while, but I do want to ask about uh, your Raw appearance recently because that, for me, that really stood out because uh, a little sneak behind you know the camera. We talked briefly last year because I wanted to get this up and going. A lot of stuff got in the way. Never was able to quite get things going the way I wanted to. Fast forward almost a full year, and there you are on Raw. And I, at first, I didn't even like it. Didn't even click because you know sometimes with enhancement guys. You, you just kind of zone out. You don't necessarily look that closely, especially when there's multiple people at once. Yes. It's kind of, it's kind of just a wave of people, you know? And yes. then I was like, wait a second. And then it clicked. I was like, whoa, how did, how did that happen? And what was the experience like? Yeah. So uh, it's fun. I mean, I've been doing extra work for WWE since 2003. Yeah. Uh, off and on, you know, uh, but for whatever reason, I've never had a raw match. Uh, and that's one of those, again, you know, that's one of those bucket list things. Like, I grew up watching Monday Night Raw. Uh, 30 years in January. Yeah, which is crazy to me because I, I remember being excited for the first one, you know? <laughs> like, uh, and just like, I mean, just full circle there, like, when Tony Mamaluke and I won the Ring of Honor tag titles, it was at the Manhattan Center. And that's... You know, like, dude, that's where the first Raw was. Like, oh my God, you know. But anyways, so, uh, but yeah, I've been doing, I've been doing extra stuff from for WWE for forever. You know, my whole adult life, I've been, and uh, I've had matches. I've had darks. <clears throat> I, I did an ECW match, <clears throat> but for whatever reason, I just the Raw spot never happened. Uh. Well, this last one, you know, uh, I, I stay I stay pretty busy. You know, anything in the southeast, I try to make sure my emails are sent out in time and uh, let them know, like, hey, I, I'd love to be a part of the show. And I've got so many friends that work for the company. It's it's just hilarious to me, and like, it's one of those things that I don't really take into thought until we were at raw this time and the guy that i got pinned with is uh one of my best friends and we were standing waiting for our physicals and as we're standing there every time someone would pass by they would you know kind of give the wave to the extras and then stop and go sal you know and it's just i've been around forever so i know you know and uh as we're doing that, Adam Pierce walks by, who was the agent on the match, and he goes, "Oh my God, Sal!" He's like, "Yeah, what's up, Pierce? Who I've known from you know, I knew Pierce from my Ring of Honor days." Yeah, and he's like, "You're working tonight." And I go, "I hope so." <laughs> and he goes, "No, I'm telling you right now, uh, I got a spot. It's yours." I was like, "Oh my God!" Like, turn it down. There's more extras behind me. I don't want that heat. But like, yes, <laughs> a million times. And uh, he was like, yeah, you know, we're, it's going to be three or four guys. We'll figure it out. But you're 100% one of the guys. I was like, oh, my God, this is this is perfect. But I've also been in that boat before where earlier this year, in April of this year, I was supposed to get squashed by beer on Raw. And they swapped it out. Like, Raw goes on the air. When Raw starts on TV, oh, when, uh, when Raw starts on TV, I'm scheduled to be working beer. And by the end of the first segment, they swap me out for somebody else. Oh, wow. So Yeah. So like now I know, like I don't ever tell anybody, like I have a match at segment eight, please watch. Yeah. But you know, Pierce, Pierce runs it by me and uh, I just happen to be first in line for the physical. And he's like, when you're done with the physical, go ahead and meet me down at ringside. 
So I go down by ringside and him and Omos are talking and they're talking about the finish and I go, oh, I'll take that. And Pierce goes, uh, that's a scary bump. Are you sure you want to do that? And he was like, make, make one of the kids take that. I go, no, no, no. Like my son gets to see me on Raw. I'm going to take up as much TV time as I can. Even getting pinned, there's more face time for me if I'm eating that finish because you're going to show a replay of the finish. That's a smart way to look at it because I don't think a lot of people would necessarily look at it that way. You know, if anything, a lot of people would probably be like, oh, I don't want to be pinned. You know, what if it, you know, but you're smart. You see that as more television exposure, more Absolutely. showing people who I am and what I can do because it's like a commercial when you're on TV. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. That's all it is. It's me selling myself. And like, if I can do anything, I can fall down and make things look like they hurt <laughs> because at my age, they usually do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, but like, so, you know, I'm like, please let me eat the finish. And he goes, okay, yeah, no, 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 it's yours if you want it. He goes, but, I, you know, I take that bump at practice all the time. It sucks. I go, oh, I have no doubt about that. <laughs> but, you know, we, we're going to do this. Uh, and my buddy, my buddy was the one that, that got pinned, you know, with me. Mm. And so uh, it was, it was just super cool that like the two of us that, you know, like we, constantly are texting each other about stupid like today he just texted me he goes hey when are we going to add manu to the bloodline (laughs) (laughs) fantastic Fantastic. i hope hope never i hated when he got added to legacy (laughs) oh what a reference like no that's fair yeah but i mean that's that's our conversations constantly uh but you know, and so like, we, I was it was just such a super super insane moment that we got to do that together. But like, right before we go out, you know, we're in Gorilla and Austin Theory's the segment before us, and I've known Theory forever, you know, and and Rollins, who I talk to Rollins all the time. They're both coming through Gorilla, and they're just like, oh, my God, Sal, like, this is awesome. I'm so glad you get to do this. You know, and there's Pierce, and I'm with MVP, who, you know, like who we talked about earlier, I did Impact with, you know, 100 million years ago. And it's just AJ like and Truth were probably there, right? Yeah, 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 I know. And Gallows Crazy. is back. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's just so many guys. Like I said, I mean, it, it, it's, it's nuts. The number of guys, you know, especially like Pete, Petey, Petey's an agent there. Uh, Abyss. You know, Abyss is an agent. Yeah, it's just wild. But uh, right before we go out, like I told my buddy, I said, hey, I'm going to kind of drag my feet a little bit because I know our entrance isn't on TV and I'm going to try to drink up as much of this as I can. And he goes, oh, yeah, no, 100%. I'm with you. And so like it was just one of those, like, I genuinely hope everybody that ever has the urge to lace up a pair of boots and chases this dream gets that feeling at least once. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's crazy to think that, like, because I've been on Raw before and, you know, backstage segments and security spots and all that stuff, but to finally get this mat, like, I'm 40 years old. I just turned 40 in September. And happy birthday. Oh, thank you. And here I am on Raw, right? Like, it's just, and it was worth every, every hurdle that I had to jump to get to that point. Even if it was just two minutes and I, you know, I didn't get anything but a choke and a forearm, I did it. Right, like that's the ulti- and like I made sure like there was very few people I texted, but I made sure I texted my son, said, "Hey, baby, make sure you're watching Raw tonight." Because again, I'm not going to tell him I've got a match just in case he gets scratched or something. Because yeah. I've been, I've had darks before where I've been at the curtain, and they've said, "Ah, scratch it!" I'm like, no, 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 don't scratch it. I'm ready to go. Like. Change of plans. We're having this match. So, like, I, I just 
I, I tried to eliminate all the variables, and but I made sure he knew, like, please be watching around this time. And uh, as cool as all of it was, and like, keep in mind, so we're out there during the commercial break and they're showing commercials to the live crowd. And one of the commercials is for the Undertaker's Netflix show. So like, I'm standing at ringside when the gong hits. And I'm like, oh, 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 oh. yeah, awesome. <laughs> that's super cool, right? Like, I know Undertaker's not coming out, but I'm, one of my dreams was always to be a druid. Like, that was always the extra goal for me, was to be a druid. And I'm like, here I am at ringside, Undertaker's music's playing. Like, this is super cool. Uh, but getting to... Uh, getting to come back and like just that feeling of knowing like everything I was supposed to do, I crushed, uh, you know, almost was super happy. Pierce sent me a really heartfelt text afterwards, just like, you know, uh, very congratulatory. Uh, but you know, and just a bunch, there was a bunch of guys that were genuinely happy for me, but there was nothing better than getting back to my phone and having, that text from my son. Uh, uh, it just, it's, it's nuts, the dream. man. It's the yeah, dream. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I've said it, I've said, I've probably said it 20 times a night. I will never stop saying it. I'm just a, I'm a lucky dude, man. I'm a very, very, very lucky. Uh, and, uh, you know, just got to keep this ball rolling. And those you know, moments like, are going to live forever too. Like, you know, it's on Peacock, it's on WWE Network, it's on uh, in some yeah. parts, it's on Disney Plus, and then it's you know on YouTube, it's on all these places all over the world, and it's probably gonna outlive future generations to come. You know, one hundred percent. You know, it's it, it's wild. It's just cra it's just crazy to think like as much of a tiny little foot footnote as it is, like my name's now on that list of people that have performed on Raw. You think about all the hundreds of millions of people that put on wrestling boots and wanted to do this and be a part of this industry that never got that shot. And like, now my name's forever on that list and it can't be undone. Yeah. It's wonderful. So real quick, what was it like working with him? Because he, is he the most... Is he the largest individual you've ever wrestled? He's, got he's, be, right? he's the largest. He's, he's the largest individual that's ever been alive. Uh, my favorite. Yes, my favorite part is so right before we go out because we've got the spot where I jump on his back and then the three of us that are still up start hitting him. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pierce, who's our agent, goes, "Hey guys, I know you know this, but like, make those shots count. Like, he's a big guy." Don't throw weak shots because then in turn, everybody involved is going to look weak. Make, make these, make these shots mean something, you know? And uh, right before I go out, Pierce tells me, he goes, Hey, lay him in, you know? Cause like I've got his back. So I know I'm just throwing forearms to his back. I know how to hit very solid, very, in very safe places. You know, a forearm to the back's not going to kill you. So I'm fired up. I'm ready to go. The, the lights are on, blah, 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 blah. We get to the spot. I kid you not. I bring my forearm back, and I have never in a million years ever swung my forearm. I mean, I'm, I'm Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire in one. Like, I'm swinging for all the fences. Right? Like, this is more than a moonshot. This is a Saturn shot. I'm going, like, I blast him with a forearm right to the back. And he goes, harder. <laughs> That's fantastic. Harder? I can't. <laughs> like, dude, I just shot on you, and you don't even know it. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh. Harder, literally impossible for me. Bro, you win. Like, we just take it home now. Every ounce of energy you can muster. <laughs> yes. Nothing. Every, everything I had, I hit this man with. And he was just like, dude, you, I'm going to need you to connect. I'm like, what? 
Uh, but yeah, it was. I mean, it was. It was very cool. I mean, he was so gracious, and the whole time he was. You know, I'm green, but I. You know, once I get it, I got it. And I mean, he. He was awesome. He was. Uh, we did a spot where he gave me a gourd buster. And, you know, normally you hook the head for a suplex. My arm didn't reach around. It wow. wasn't a lack of effort. It was just the fact that he is an elephant-sized man. <laughs> and my arms only go so long. And, you know, that that's the kind of person that you're not going to just find. You're not going to be able to just pick out, like, you know, people yes. can be critical. But, A, you made it sound like he's humble and hard and wants to learn, which is awesome. But also, yes. you just... You can't teach size, you know, you can't. No, no, he, I mean, he passes the airport test. There's not a place in the world where he walks that people don't stop and look to see what he's doing. I think he might, like, pass the spaceship test because he's not, yes. he probably yes. from up there. Like, no, <laughs> they're scanning. They're just like, oh, that's a mountain. No, that's a man. That's, that's big old dude. But, I mean, he, he couldn't have been more more humble. He couldn't have been nicer. I mean, he, uh, he definitely went out of his way to thank us multiple, multiple times. And, you know, especially with, with Banks, to just, you know, uh, it was one of those things where I think I took the squisher in the buckle and I'm selling down and MVPs are ringside yelling and I kind of just, you know, I'm laying there and I'm looking over and I'm just like, this is this is storybook stuff. 20 you know? years after working with them, you know, yeah. in front of, I don't know how many people, probably 100, 200 people, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, this thing is like walking down that ramp and impact was a big deal. Yeah. You know, for both of us at the time, because, you know, he was also, you know, he's trying to get looked at just like I was. Absolutely. And, and for it to, uh, you know, come full circle where we're sold out, sold out house in Charlotte, uh, it was, it was one of those, like I said, I'm, I'm so fortunate that I learned to stop and appreciate the moment. And I did. And I mean, it was just, you know, like I said, no matter what happens from this moment forward, that can never be undone. Uh, it was, it was super, super cool fairy tale storybook stuff. It Minus, was you know. No, I was just saying, minus me being dropped from 7,000 feet in the air. <laughs> I mean, you, you even have the giant, so it is a literal fairy tale. Yes, yes. If I'm lucky enough to interview again, this was amazing. Thank you, by the way. Um, there's so much to discuss. You know, I want to go over your other experiences with WWE. I want to go over wrestling road diaries. Oh, man, I really want to go over that. We didn't yeah. even touch on Ring of Honor. Barely yeah, touched on Jimmy Rave. Like, yeah. I could talk... I could probably talk to you for another four or five hours if I wanted to. Like you, but before we go, would you consider that your favorite WWE appearance, just because of everything that went into it? If not, uh, I say the story, but I would. It's the most fulfilling by far, just because you know the, it, 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 there's the whole aspect of of my son got to see me. Uh you know, plus, you know, like I said, I, I 40 years old. I'm 40 years old. I shouldn't be wrestling on Raw. And here I am, 40 years old, wrestling on Raw. You know, like, yeah. it's just, it's so improbable. Uh, but it's just, it was just, it was an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, you know, but like I said, the, 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 the most, by far the most fulfilling, just because all the people that were there that, that were excited for me, um uh, and and getting to get back to my phone and having that text from uh my son was yeah it was super cool super cool and this interview was super cool i really appreciate you doing it and oh, thank you yeah thank you so much um like i said there's so many questions still i'd like to go over in the future but uh before we wrap things up let's get to the plugs because there's you know, after you dedicated two hours of your time, people need to follow you on social media and you check out your pro wrestling key store. So just everything you've got. Yes, please. You can follow me on Twitter at Sal Renaro. That's R I N A U R O. A lot of vowels. My parents hated me <laughs> or they really liked Pat Sajak and wheel of fortune. I don't know. Uh, 
you, out on Instagram at Sal underscore Renaro because I messed up making the first account because I'm not good at technology. Uh, Facebook, Sal Renaro. And my Pro Wrestling Tees, it's Pro Wrestling Tees backslash. That's right. You guessed it. Sal Renaro. Beauty of having an insane name. Not a lot of us Renaros running around. Uh, I also do want to plug. We are uh, literally, uh, I mean, by the time this posts, it might be too late, but uh, yeah. I'm literally less than 24 hours away from getting on a plane to head to uh, New Orleans for uh, NWA Hard Times 3 and uh, the, the Revolution Rumble afterwards. But you can always follow us on uh, at Fight TV. Uh, you follow the NWA product. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be all over that. Uh, follow and, on you know, YouTube too. Definitely follow yes, on YouTube. Yes. Uh, and next time I'm on, I'm on I'll have, uh, yeah, I've got a million great NWA stories. That yeah. On my notes, because you saw the notes, it's like probably a hundred pages long. I had a lot yes. of Ring of Honor. There's a lot of NWA. So I would definitely love to talk to you more again. Thank you so much again, everybody. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Uh, make sure to follow him. Make sure to check out his Pro Wrestling Tea Store. And yeah, let's just keep on loving pro wrestling because this was a great conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, hey. guys. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.